Cool. So uh, I'm the second talk of the day, and uh, my talk is going to be about <coughs> a paper with a pretty long title. It's called Row Hammer <laughs> Flipping Bits in Memory Without Accessing Them, Colon, Even More Stuff. Uh, and experiment in something, but that doesn't really matter. So, uh, my name is Vishnu, and uh, I'm a year four com com computer science student, just like Jin. Uh, I and we are actually part of NUS Hackers, which is a club slash uh, society in NUS. This is my second time here. I was here exactly twelve papers we we love ago, one year ago. Wow. <laughs> Anniversary. Anniversary. <laughs> uh, presenting the Diffie Hellman Key A Key Exchange which is also a security related paper and today is another security related paper even though I have no academic experience in security at all it just seems to click with my interest so the paper uh, it's called uh, so colon an experiment study of DRAM disturbance errors uh, and this is a joint publication by CMU and, and Intel labs the reason why it fascinated me so much is when we always talk about software exploits it's something to do with software it's a bug in software Either a programmer made a mistake, or it's usually a programmer made a mistake somewhere, or you forgot to check something. But this is a hardware bug that affects software. And that fascinated me. Like, a mistake in hardware, or so-called mistake in hardware, which you cannot fix because you can't patch hardware, is now affecting software forever. And it's almost unpatchable, just because of the, of the way hardware is. Where you, when, once you release hardware, that's it. So before we talk about what the paper's about, let me just give you a brief history lesson on what DRAM is. DRAM stands for dynamic RAM, and that's the kind of RAM that we have in all of our machines. Sorry, memory layer. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yep, a lot of jokes like that sprinkled inside the talk. So DRAM stands for dynamic RAM, and it's the kind of, kind of RAM that we have in every single machine that we touch these days. There were, previously in the 90s, there was, there was a thing called SRAM, but it wasn't performant enough, so they made this thing called DRAM, for dynamic RAM. Here's an example of a kind of DDRAM out there. This is the Micron something. And uh, this is a 1 MB chip. So this entire chip holds exactly 1 megabyte information, which means there's about they 1 million. Normally. Sorry? RAM chips are normally sold in terms of bits. So when you say 1024, yeah. that's 1024 megabit. Sorry, megabit, which makes it 138 KB. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, you're right. It's actually 138 KB. And uh, yeah, so there's actually like 1 million dots in here, if you count. So, uh, so, so each single dot here is called a DRAM cell. And to understand the flaw here, we actually need, need to learn exactly how a DRAM cell works. I'm going to simplify a lot of electrical like engineering skills here and just simplify things so that we can all understand them. That's a, what a DRAM cell looks like. There are two, two electrical lines here. There's a word line at the top, and there's a bit line that goes vertically as well. So the, the, the word line goes horizontally, the bit line goes ver 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 vertically. And the two components here, there is the, there's a transistor. The simplest way to understand a transistor, a transistor is just a switch. You give, when you give electricity on the, top, on the top line, the transistor would basically make the thing on the left talk to the thing on the right, and it connects them to, together electrically. That's it. If you don't give electricity at, at, the, at the top, they won't be connected. That's what a transistor is. The second component here is a capacitor. This is the capacitor. A capacitor holds a charge, as simple as that. So we hold a charge to signify one bit, like as bit one. We, and, if, and if the capacitor doesn't hold a charge, that's bit zero. And uh, that's all we need to know. And uh, the way that these capacitors are designed, they lose their charge every 64 milliseconds. So every 64 milliseconds, if there is a charge, it goes below a certain threshold where we can't tell that apart from noise. So every 64 milliseconds, we need to keep recharging them, which is the important con concept as well. So let's say, okay, so th this is an example of the same bit, and that bit has <coughs> one, so basically uh, green, sorry, blue means one volt, and zero means zero volt. So uh, let, let us assume that there's a potential charge difference of one volt on the capacitor right now, which means if I connect the capacitor to, to something, it would discharge at one volt. And one volt equals to one bit in this example. Let's see how like a DRAM microcontroller would read that. So what it first does is, it, so a capacitor holds a charge of one volt. The bit line gets activated to half the potential difference. So one minus zero divided by two is 0 0.5. So the bit line gets activated to pre-charged to 0 0.5 volts. And then we activate the word line. So as I said, the word line is the one that touches the transistor. So once you touch the transistor, the transistor now activates. And you basically, this can now talk to that. And what happens is since one volt is higher than 0 0.5 volts, 
the capacitor discharge discharges itself and uh, it discharges itself and the potential difference in the bit line increases very sli slightly it goes from 0 0.5 to like for example 0, 0 0.55 because of the tiny hole that the capacitor just discharged note here that by reading it we actually destroyed that capacitor because we had to extract the data from the from the capacitor so every time you read we actually destroy it. that's a thing called a sense amplifier basically what that is is it detects the fact that that line there changed from 0 0.5 to 0 0.55 it amplifies that change so that that line now becomes one. The reason why we amplify that back to one is when we read something, we don't want to destroy our data. We want to load that back into, into the capacitor. So by amplifying that into one, the capacitor gets charged again. The capacitor is recharged because of the fact that we have one volt there because a sense amplifier detected the fact that we changed from 0 0.5 to 0 0.55. We amplify that line to one and now the capacitor gets charged again. This is how and then we, swi we switch off those two things. So that's the six step process into reading the fact that this cell just had, like, like this cell is signifying one bit. Let's do the zero bit example. Uh, there basically there's no charge on the capacitor right now. We do the same thing. We activate the bit line with half the potential difference. We activate the word line. Now because of the fact that the word line has a higher potential difference than this, uh, it's gonna actually recharge. It's gonna charge the capacitor a bit and this would cause the, the potential difference in the bit line to r reduce from 0 0.5 to something 0 0.45. Sense Amplify detects that, and it, like, so the, the Sense Amplify now knows that that cell is holding a, zero, a bit zero. It amplifies that into nothing, which causes the capacitor to, dis to discharge again, basically get refreshed, and it becomes zero again, and the capacitor is back to its old state, and we have read the fact that this bit is now z zero. So that's how we read the single bit. As simple as that. So one bit is cool, but how do you do many gigabytes, right? So uh, that's when things get a bit more or like interesting. So we actually connect this into arrays, into horizontal arrays where the word lines are connected and vertical arrays where the bit lines are connected. And so all, uh, 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 and this is how actually RAM looks like from a microscopic scale, where the bit lines are all connected individually to their own sense, am sense amplifiers and the word lines are connected horizontally. So, so if I want to read something in this row, I activate all of my bit lines and then I activate this word, word line and I, can in, and I can immediately read every single bit in that row because they would be amplified by my sense amplifiers. Let's talk about the structure a bit. So there's a cell, holds one bit. A cell forms a bank of DRAM uh, and, and a bank is basically a 2D array. This is an 8 times 8 array. It's actually huge. It's 100,000 rows by... Uh, 64,000 rows or something, and it's huge, and, and, and each bank has a row buffer. The row bu 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 buffer is basically the sense M amplifier. So whenever we, we, we read a row, that row gets copied here, that row gets erased, and then we push this back into the, that row as part of refreshing. And this is one bank. One chip that you see, if you've seen the DRAM chips before, you see like physically black chips on it. Each physical chips usually co co uh, like co corresponds eight or 16 banks. So, and the reason why we have eight or 16 banks is so that we can do things in parallel. Because I if you realize we can only read one bit at a time. So each bank can only read one bit at a time. So if you have eight of them or more, you can read things in par parallel now, which makes things far faster and more performant. Let's talk back to the array now. And let's see, let's just throw in some numbers here. And let's say we get a command from the CPU that says, hey, I want you to read row three, column four. So what actually happens is the memory controller tells row three to open itself. It's called the open row procedure where the bit lines get charged as before, the word line gets activated. And when this happens, the value there gets discharged and copied into our row buffer through the sense amplifiers, right? And then and immediately the sense amplifiers would amplify the charge so that the charge gets back into the original cell again. And now we have read everything. We actually, by the, f by the nature of, of this design, if you want to read one row, by, if you want to read one cell, you actually read the entire row. So we have actually read exactly the value that we need. So we tell the row first, then we tell our, col our column selector, row three, column four is a zero. The cool thing here is, if you are now are going, going, going to ask for column six, you don't have to do the whole thing again, because you already have it in our row buffer. Uh, most memory controllers are smart. They're going to hold things in the row in the row buffer until it needs to change rows. 
because there's a high chance that you're going to get data sequentially because if you want to bite you at least need eight right so you are going to do things sequentially so it tries to be as smart as it can so how do you write something writing is extremely easy because every single time you read we erase so the fact so how you write something is let's say we get an instruction i want you to write zero on that same cell all you need to do is you update your row buffer to zero sense amplifier sets that entire bit line to zero which is nothing and that instantly gets uh, set back on the thing on the thing itself that's how you read and write stuff so reading actually destroys cells closing row so the close row mechanism is let's say i want you the cpu says read another, another row basically you have to clear your row buffer so all you do is you deactivate all you deactivate your word line you deactivate you and you discharge your by hotline i mean uh my bit line that's autocorrect there um, <laughs> and then you clear your row buffer and that that's what we call close row and remember previously i said that capacitors lose their charge instantly i mean they lose their charge every 64 milliseconds so this reading process which is basically refreshing needs to be done every 64 mi milliseconds to every cell so every cell here loses their entire entire thing in 64 milliseconds so every 64 milliseconds this scan that you see here happens and the the thing is you may think this is very inefficient because every 64 milliseconds i need to do 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 this but actually the process of reading is extremely fast we can actually open a, we, we can open a row and read a single bit in about 50 nanoseconds and there are about 1.2 million 50 nanoseconds in 64 milliseconds so we can actually access the same row about 1.2 million times before it needs to be refreshed again. so we it's actually quite performant key takeaway so far about how DRAM works uh, reading one bit requires the entire row to be re refreshed and every 64 milliseconds we refresh every single bit so if you have 8 GB of RAM every single bit gets refreshed 64 milli milliseconds now let's talk about disturbances and what the paper actually uh, discovered which is what the paper is all about Sorry. yeah question before so the, uh, the communication between the, the RAM and the CPU, is it really per single byte? No, it's not. Uh, it actually gives like a, I believe it gets a set of, of, of instructions to the memory controller and the memory controller does all that. Okay, yeah. but, but is it going to uh, be The like data bus is 64 bits. Uh, these days you typically have dual channel memory at the very least, so 128 bits per read. Right, but, but, but does that correspond to a single row? Because yeah, but, well, uh, here, no, what is that's, that's why there's a memory controller in the way on the... So there's, there's two the memory controllers and everything. You have a memory controller in your CPU that says, give me these addresses to the RAM module. The RAM module has its own internal thing, which you can think of as what the SSD controller does of like, hey, I'm going to put uh, this physical memory there and that physical memory here because I know this row is broken for some reason. And, and that goes into... Like bit level shuffling, it's not like oh. Uh, you generally it, it generally goes row at a time. Mm -hmm. So if there's one row that's bad, it'll just take it off the. But when one row is not 128 bits. One row is not 128 bits. Much much longer. Uh, right? it's yeah, much, it's much, longer much longer because it's across multiple memory yeah. chips. As much, well. much 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 yeah. much longer. Okay. But you don't read from every memory uh, chip on. Uh, you you won't read from every chip that's on the mo module at a time. Continuing on uh, to disturbances, which is actually what the paper discovered. So the problem here is that we as consumers, we always want things to be smaller, faster, and cheaper. And that's how things are always working. So if you look at the graph over there, like the DRAM part over there, the size of DRAM has been decreasing exponentially. Where in 2000, the size of DRAM used to be around, I don't know what that is in log terms, but somewhere in between one gigabyte and 500 megabits per centimeter square. And right now we are somewhere at actually 15, uh, 15 or so gigabits per centimeter square. And the reason is as things become, as these cells become closer and closer and closer to, together, it becomes harder for manufacturers to build cells that are completely electrically sealed. And this would cause like charge leakages and sometimes cause like real issues. That's what the paper discovered. So back to a pictorial a representation here on what they actually discovered. So this is an array of cells. I want to read the middle row, so I activate all my bit lines. I activate my word line, which is a horizontal line. And what they discovered is if you hammer this, hammer is just basically you hit the same line the maximum nu number of times you can before it refreshes, like this. If you hammer it like 1.2 million times in a refresh, a charge could accidentally leak from there into the transistor below. 
because of the fact that these things are nanometers apart, right? So a charge could accidentally leak from there to a transistor below. What that basically does is that activates that transistor. Whatever charge in there gets leaked into that, that bit line. Because the only thing protecting you from the bit line is the transistor. So if a charge leaks there, the bit there is going to get flipped. Because if it's a zero, it becomes a one now. And it was if it was a one, now it became zero. And it and it could could get flipped like that. And so that's exactly what row hammer is. So that's basically the concept of row hammer, where you hammer the same row many, 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 many times. You cause an, a, a, you basically cause a charge leakage to happen just because of how close they were together. This didn't used to be a problem, but now it is just because of how uh, close are, how chips are. And the paper tries to prove that row hammer exists using code. So there were two pieces of, of assembly code. I know we all hate assembly, but this is only five lines. So it should be easy to understand. So let's first look at the control. So what the control does is, it's a function and we morph, which basically copies a bit or a, yeah, I think that copies a bit or whatever, like is an X into a CPU re uh, a register. And then we call CL flush. CL flush basically is flush as a cache. Uh, CPU has its own uh, like L1, L2, blah, blah, blah cache. And we have to flush the cache because if you ask for the same like X again, it's going to get that from the cache. So, so you always need to clear your CPU cache. And this is what the code actually does. So let's assume that X is there, is, is asking for that bit. And uh, let's say you, you ask for, for that bit to be copied into a, a register. And if you run this code like millions of times, what the memory controller actually does, it, it basically opens the row. Or, and before that, to run the experiment, they actually like allocated a few gigabytes. Ba they basically maximize the RAM chip and set all the bits to zero. So that when you, if something flips, you can see that it flipped. So they set everything to either zero or one, de depending on whether they were they were looking for a charge or, or a discharge leakage. So that's what X is. And they found out that because the fact that the data actually gets cached in the row, row buffer, like even if you access a few million times, you're only going to get data from the row buffer every single time, which means you're not hammering that line. And uh, they detected that there were no flips. Data was consistent. In the other code, let's assume that X and Y is now here. So you ask for X, you copy to, the, to a register, you, then, then you move Y into another register, then you flush your CPU caches. We flush a cache, the only way to now get this data now is to, to, is to, is to load the entire row again, is to open that row again. So this basically caused this to happen. Uh, basically caused the rows to be flipped. I mean, they caused this to happen. And once they did this, they realized that randomly, the adjacent rows that were adjacent to those target rows were get, uh, getting flipped. And this is what basically, and this is how they proved that this is indeed an occurrence, by having a control that did not ha like hammer a row, and then by just hammering two rows they proved that this happened. So this code were inducing errors and that code was not, proving that row hammer is indeed a pro problem. Because of the fact that we can't actually inspect these RAM chips because they're built in such a close fashion and we don't even know how they are designed. So this is the only way to like actually like experiment and test on these things. Question, how do you pick the right X and Y, right? This is actually very hard to pick because uh, virtual memory, we don't have access to the real memory. How do you know that the X and Y is in the same chip, in the same array, in the same fashion, and they're actually going to activate two different rows. So what they did in the experiment is they had physical access to, they had bare metal access because the paper wasn't about finding a security expert. The paper was actually finding out about the hardware bug. So they had physical access to, uh, to, the, to the hardware itself and they had pseudo access. So there is a process called slash proc slash, slash PID slash page map where you can actually get the where you can actually get the relationship between virtual memory and, f and physical physical address space. And by using that, you can make sure that your X and Y are close enough to be in the same bank, but different enough to be on different rows. That's what they did. But from an unprivileged standpoint, what you can just do is you can assume that they are either eight or 16 banks. So if you just ask for two random memory addresses, there's a one by eight chance that uh, they would be on the same bank, which is pretty good enough for statistical like analysis. So one by eight chance, if you're assuming that they're they are, they are eight banks, to make your chances even higher, you can hammer four or eight uh, rows, like four or eight bits at once. You don't have to just do two. And you can do double sided row hammer, which is basically, that requires a bit of, of like trickery. So what the double sided row hammer is, once you've figured out the number of bits in one row, it takes a while to fi figure that out through row hammering by finding out just by doing a lot of like mathematical analysis from, from hammering. You can actually then row hammer the 
the first row and the third row at the same time, which would cause which which has a very high chance to cause a leakage in the in the middle in the middle in the middle in the in the middle row. Basically, so if you hammer this row and this row at the same time, there's a high chance that you'll cause a leakage there just because of the fact that there's more pressure on that row to induce a leakage. So that's what double sided row hammering is. Next, the paper goes on to talk about uh, what their setup was and what they found out through experimentation. They built in FPGAs and stuff. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, to get such low level access, right? And the heater is there actually because they had a hypothesis that if things were hot, the chance of row hammering is higher, but it actually wasn't true. So temperature is not a matter yet, t t turns out. So th these are some graphs that they found out. So three manufacturers here. So ABC are different manufacturers. They don't want to like, like expose them. So uh, th these are three different man manufacturers and the, er the errors per cell and the year where the manufacturer, uh, the year where the DRAM chip was made. So through this, you can find out that this happened to, this error started out basically in 2010. So they, they guessed that in 2010, they, like all the manufacturers, they started to change their process in some way. They either like experimented on, on a new process to compact things to, to together, which caused like this, uh, this error to have happened. And the second thing is just, once the spike goes up, there's a trend of it going down, which means that the manufacturers actually realized that this is an issue and they've been trying to solve it in some way, which is why the trend has been going down to 2014. And, and like there's one chip there in 2014 that does not show this error at all. When did, this, when did this paper come out? 2014. So, okay. Yeah, so that's the end of the research here. Mm -hmm. uh, other few cool graphs in the paper is this. Uh, this is, if you change the, re the refresh interval, so the refresh in interval is every 64 milliseconds, it's going to refresh itself. If you make it shorter, the chance of row hammer is less because that, that makes sense, right? Because if the refresh interval is 64 and you access it every 50 milliseconds, you, you can hammer a row 1.2, 1.1 million times. If you reduce the refresh interval, you can only hammer it less. So there is a correlation between the number of times you hammer a row versus, I mean, the, uh, uh, to the chance of, of a bit flipping, which completely makes sense. That's the opposite correlation there, where the activation interval, which is basically how many nanoseconds do you wait between a hammer? So it's, it's basically inverse, because if you wait longer between hammers, you get less hammers between a refresh, because every time you get a refresh, all the... Uh, things will basically you're back to a uh, reset state. One more final graph I'd like to show is, this is uh, uh, basically a distribution of, uh, they hammered, row, in this graph, row zero was the one that was hammered, and this is the relative rows that were flipped, based off row zero. So it's obvious that minus one and one has the most here because that's the one that's closest. And their theory on why there are flips in row set, uh, three and seven is because some chips, uh, the, they, they basically, some chips uh, is basically uh, like, like because of row re remap. They say that, that there's a chance that uh, like the, the actual f physical rows are not in order compared to logic for some re reason. And that's actually why they saw like a consistent, like a high a number in three and seven. You can try it at home. Uh, so Google uh, pu published this thing called Row Hammer Test, and I downloaded it. I ran, ran it into my, sh my machine. I only ran like 50 iterations. I believe if you run millions of, 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 of iterations, you could find a bug, a, like a flaw in your actual machine. But I think this issue has been solved in DDR4, which is what most of our there machines are using. There's a paper that just came out a month ago or something that shows some DDR4 modules are still vulnerable. Okay. Yeah. But in general, the ER4 is supposed to fix it. Yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. So I, I, I ran this in mine, and this is what one iteration looks like. It's basically trying to access 4.3 billion, uh, billion uh, hammers per each map, like address. So basically, it, it allocates one GB of a memory, and it tries to hammer like every single bit. Yeah. It takes about 49 nanoseconds per hammer in my machine. But, but, but don't you need to know? all kinds of details of the physical layout of the thing. How, how can you write a, a, this test program so that it will work on your machine and my machine when the, the, the RAM chips we use are going to be completely different in terms of layout? The, layout uh, the generic grid layout is the same for every RAM chip. 
so and you can just make random assumptions and because we we don't know which bits are, are are weak and if there is a weak bit that bit is repeatable and for every single device it's different so is this is, is this a pro is this a pro probability thing where we have to ra randomly try to flip flip a bit they also do interesting things like they assign chunks of memory and then try to see what physical addresses they got and based on that guess whether how big a row is how long a row is and all these things so they do a lot of I, yeah. if I remember already there's like there's a bunch of random assignments and we assign it and we assign it and we assign it uh, just to figure out the structure of the memory at the beginning and once it has that uh, then it can actually do much more predictable that's also one of the reasons why the, the native versions of this are much quicker than uh, the JavaScript version that yep. someone pushed out because the JavaScript version can't unlock its memory block. So that's just going to turn up somewhere and then be paged out and it doesn't know that it's been paged out. So it's a lot slower. Whereas uh, if you're doing it in something native, you can just yeah, allocate me uh, three giant bloody buffers and mm -hmm. then lock them in physical memory and you can't evict them. Turn there's some RAM that called yeah, ECC, right? Yes. Yeah, I'll right? be talking about that soon, actually, oh, okay, about okay, how okay. ECC is a, major, is a potential mitigator to okay. this. So that's what the paper described, and the paper actually ends here. The paper did not go on to like explain how this could be exploited. More, most of the work that I'm going to show on now was done by the Google Project Zero Zero team. So they picked up the paper immediately when it was published. Five months la later, they made a blog post saying that Here's what we found. And they basically were able to build proof of call concepts in two platforms. In NACL, native client, uh, where you can run C slash C++ code in, uh, in Chrome, and in Linux uh, as well. And the NACL one was immediately patched uh, through an easy patch, but the Linux kernel uh, privilege like escalation cannot be patched, just because of how it's designed. So I'm going to talk about the second one. And a bit of basic knowledge that we need is we need to learn about what memory protection is. So a very quick computer science class on what is memory protection. Um, what is unprotected memory? So many, many years ago when memory was first created, memory wasn't protected. Where uh, if you are process A and you ask for X amount of memory, this is basically a linear layout of RAM. The OS would just say, hey, you can access everything from 11111 to 333, 333. Try not to go beyond that but just do your best. <laughs> Process B comes along and said, I, I would like some memory as well. Here's what you have. Try not to go beyond that, do your best, right? The problem here is there's nothing stopping Process B from actually touching pro Process A's RAM. And if it does, it could crash Process A, or if it touches something that belongs to the kernel, it would instantly cause a kernel panic. And that's why all systems were really, really unstable. Ha everything we touch nowadays have uh, memory protection. And this is what memory protection is, where your physical RAM, and we as pro processors, we don't have access to physical RAM at all. We can't even see what's inside. It's a co a co completely controlled by the kernel. And let's say there's a, and every single process gets its own virtual memory. It's almost like an infinite amount of space that starts from zero to FFFFFF. And you, you can do whatever you want in here completely, and the layout of this doesn't have to map to the, f to the physical lay 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 layout at all. So if you try to, like use some amount of memory in your process that gets mapped in physical m memory and it doesn't even have to be a continuous block it's completely hit, hit, hidden to you because that's how virtual memory works if there's a si second pro 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 process and that would also get its, its own space in physical memory the cool thing here is this uh promotes security because you can only access whatever you have access to and you cannot access anyone else's m m her memory which makes things crash proof and also it's a really 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 big like sec uh, security point because I can only access my own things, right? So I can't change things that belong to other processors or other uh, like, sy like, like, sy like system stuff. This mapping here is held by, uh, by this thing called a Linux page table. A uh, page is basically the minimum amount of memory you can ask from the system. In most systems, a page is for kilobytes. You can ask for two, two, two megabytes through the thing called huge pages, but that doesn't matter right now. Uh, just assume that four kil kilobytes is the, is the minimum you, you can ask. A page table stores the mapping between that arrows there, right? So that basically stores the mapping between virtual addresses for a process and the physical address in physical memory. Each mapping uh, is saved in the page table, and each table can hold up to 512 mappings. Uh, yes. So which means that 
uh, and each sorry and each uh, where's my two GB? Okay, yeah. So uh, so every two megabytes of virtual memory requires a four kilobyte page file, because you because each page is four KB. Four times five five one two is two megabytes, and so every two megabytes of virtual memory requires a four KB page file to be written into physical RAM, which is controlled by the OS, which we don't have control to. Now let's talk about the exploit. So this is how the exploit works. We, so this is our process here, and our process is, is running in user land, so it's completely unprivileged, but we can do anything that C can do. So first thing we do is um, we allocate shared, uh, like a shared memory file through this thing called def, uh, dev, dev slash shared memory, where we're basically telling the OS, I'm going to allocate this file here, or this, this uh, like a few pay pages, and I want this to be shared. And that's how it would look like, right? So that's the block in, in our virtual, uh, virtual address space and that will get created in the physical address space as well. Actu in, in actuality, it's actually controlled by a page file because for every single mapping, there's a page file there and it's written in the page file that uh, that page file is basically what's in the page file is this processes blah, blah, blah address linked to the blah, blah, blah address in physical memory. That's what a page file is. And the exploit, what the exploit does is it maps that file using mmap millions of times. And what it does is when you mmap a file in shared mem memory space because of memory deduplication, you don't actually recreate, you don't actually reallocate that memory in physical RAM. You just create more page tables that point to that same thing. So you have all this, these addresses in virtual memory <coughs> that are pointing to page tables that are pointing to the same amount of, of memory in RAM. You spray the entire physical uh, memory with page ta tables. These, these are only four ki kilobytes large, but if you do it a million times, that's uh, four gigabytes. Yeah, one million times is four gigabytes. So you spray the entire physical memory with page ta tables. This is where thing, things are going to get exciting. <laughs> so we know that for any of these virtual addresses here, I mean, the, these virtual files here, if they're all controlled by a page table, right? and every page table has the mapping written inside it. What if you bit flip the mapping? You, and if you bit flip a mapping, because of the fact that probabilistically, most of your memory is now page tables, if you bit flip the mapping, you're not gonna point to something else. So the page table is not gonna say, basically, since you created this file, the page table says you have read write access to this amount of memory. If you bit flip that to point to somewhere else in memory, it now says, I have read write access to that amount of memory. I just escaped Linux's uh, memory protection here because I'm now read write accessing a file that's owned, uh, a, a page that's owned by the kernel, which is a page file itself. Just a bit of a uh, uh, just a bit of a distraction. This is what a page table lo looks like. It's 64 bits. And the page addresses, so I told you there are 512 page, uh, page addresses. They're all, sorry, this is one entry itself, I'm sorry. The page addresses are, are, are stored between here and there. This is in reverse order. And the place where you want to attack is this part, because if you flip a bit in the higher order bit section there, you would get a memory address that points outside. That points outside your entire f physical RAM. So you want to flip a bit in the lower uh, bit range of your page address. And the chance of you doing that is 31%. So if you cause a bit flip in that four ki kilobyte section, there's a 31% chance that you would flip a bit there, which is where you want. If you flip a bit somewhere else, you will just crash because you can't access that, that RAM. Back to my example. So let's say we cause a bit flip there that points to another, to another place in uh, her memory and you know that there's a page file there because you spam the entire f physical RAM with page files. You can now compromise that page file because I have read where access to a page file and that page file is actually, con uh, that page file has the mappings for another memory, uh, 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 another block of virtual memory that you own. So I just compromise the entire system here because now what I can do is I can use this access to rewrite that page file to point to the entire memory space, basically saying that this process now can write, read or write the, uh, to the entire physical uh, uh, memory address. And through this thing, it's basically, basically if I try to run a file here, that's basically going to allow me to read write the entire memory address. And that's how the, this exploit works in a very simple sense. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the exploit basically. So once you have memory address, what, like once you have full memory access, what can you do? 
the Google paper goes on to explain that you could modify a set UID uh, like executable such as ping. Uh, ping is requires sudo or root access to run because ping is creating raw sockets. Not raw sockets, but it, it, it's, it, it's, o it's opening and creating its own sockets. And, but we as, uh, we as normal users, we can run ping. The reason is because it's, uh, it, like it's, it, it's basically an SUID executable, which basically says that anyone can run this, but when you run it, it gets elevated pri privileges just for that, pro that process. So you could open in C, like you could, you, you could open that executable and, and inject your own shell code into that executable in memory because of the fact that you have, I have access to everything in memory now. I could basically scan my entire like memory space and look for ping and insert code into there and I'm, and I'm now running shell code as root, which is how the privilege like escalation works. Uh, there's an optimization to that attack. The optimization is just basically using page, uh, page reuse. The previous attempt, it required us to be lucky because we, had, we needed a bit of luck. We can increase our luck by using page reuse, which basically what this is is, the first thing that we do is we allocate a huge amount of, of memory that we own in the entire physical address space. We row hammer every single bit and we find weak bits. And then we look for bits that are good for us. And when I said good for us, remember just now I said there's a 31% chance of attack in this region. So we basically look for bits that are within that 35%, 31% zone, where it's good if a bit flips there. We release that back into the memory pool by using m unmap, yeah, m unmap, which releases that four kil kilobyte block into the memory pool. We immediately ask for more RAM, which would, which would ensure that the Linux kernel would now use that as a page file. We release all the allocations that, that we have done, replacing them with page files as we have done before. Same thing again. So we know that that, like basically, if a bit flips there, it's going to be good for like good for us. We do, we do the same thing. We basically induce a bit flip, which causes that to point to something else, and now we have access to the entire physical memory in a much more uh, good way, in a much more uh, lucky way. There are more exploits that uh, so that's just one of the exploits out there. And, and the other one is the knuckle one that I spoke about. Basically, the fix that they did for that was uh, they they disallowed the use of CL flush uh, because you need CL flush to make this work. And they realized that no one actually needs CL flush if you're writing a knuckle code. So if you don't allow CL flush, patched. Uh, flip phone trade. This is the one where uh, another safe security group they made a, a compromise. Uh, they managed to compromise open uh, like open SSH and AppGet. <coughs> I haven't really read this. If you Google flip function, you'll find out more about it. The same guys who did that, they actually made an Android proof of concept called Drammer, which is basically the same thing that Google made, but on Android. So you can run that on Android because most old Android phones are still using DDR3 memory, I'm sure. And you, you, you can see if, and it takes about 30 seconds to run, if I'm not wrong, to, 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 to allocate as much RAM, RAM as it can and hammer every single bit. So how do we stop this? Uh, the good thing is, uh, this is an issue that only started in around 2010. And manufacturers, at least now, they know about it. So the chances of this happening will be reducing. But the problem here is, we can't fix this on old devices, just because of the fact that there's no way to fix it, because it's a hardware pro problem. You can't patch hardware. I can't re release a software update that says, hey, V1.1 of hardware. Uh, so we just so manufacturers screwed up in 2010, and now we 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 just had to wait for the next ver ver version of their stuff. So the paper proposes these solutions. The first one is make better chips. That's the easy answer. <laughs> if you had a time machine, problem is always solved. Uh, self correction, which is what you mentioned, ECC. So ECC does solve it in some way, but ECC only gives you single bit fixes. Double bit detection, triple bit gone. Right. So single bit fixes, and so it is not a fully foolproof solution. And it also comes with, with the performance and cost, uh, cost, which is one of the problems with e ECC. The next way is to increase your target refresh rate. So if you saw my chart just now, the place to get to the refresh rate to guarantee that uh, you would never have you, that you would never have row hammer is six point eight, sorry eight point uh, eight milliseconds. So if you reduce your refresh rate from sixty four milliseconds to eight mi milliseconds, you will never have row hammer. You can never flip a bit. But the problem with that is RAM is already spending 4% of the time refreshing. So 4% of an entire RAM's time is spent refreshing. If you, if you reduce your, your uh, refresh rate to 6 to 8 milliseconds, it's now going to spend 30% of its time refreshing, 
which would reduce the performance of RAM, it will cost more, it will spend more power doing random stuff, and that's not good as well. So these are the two better so solutions that were proposed. The first one was proposed by Google. This is a, a simple one where you identify hot rows, and hot rows, you basically have a counter. If the same row is being accessed too many times, you refresh the rows around it. Simple, right? Because I know that if this row is accessed too many times, there's a chance that that charge might leak to rows around it. So I force a refresh by basically I just read rows around it, like up to a certain point by having a counter. Uh, DDR4, so low power DDR4 has this in spec, which means that low power DDR4 should have this and should pro protect you against uh, row half hammer in some way. What's the difference between LP and non-LP? Uh, so the LP DDR specs always come out usually three to four years after the baseline spec comes oh, out. Oh, okay. The idea is, uh, so you, you used to only have like say DDR2 and LP DDR2 and DDR3 and LP DDR3. Uh, LP DDR was designed to run at a lower voltage, consume lower power, uh, generally by doing either smarter things. Generally the idea is you put LP DDR in places where cost is less of an issue because power is a massive issue. Okay. So, you know, embedded space these days on ultrabooks and stuff. Uh, it got a bit murky in the DDR3 era because you have a DDR3L and then you have an LP DDR3 and they're both low power but in different ways. Okay. And the last one that, so this was proposed by the paper, which is every time a row is, re, uh, like, like every time a row is accessed, you refresh an adjacent row with very, very low probability. And this would statistically ensure that if you try to hammer the same row, there's a good chance that the rows around it would get refreshed because you're doing it at a low probability. And as I said, you need to hit, you, you can hammer a row 1.1 million times before it gets refreshed. So low probability and that's fine. Uh, that's the end. So these, these are the links that I, I'll, I'll upload my slide somewhere. The paper link is here, the Google blog post link. There's a black hat presentation about this by the same guys who wrote the Google blog post, I think. And the Drammer POC, which you, you can actually install on any of your Android phones if you trust untrusted sources, which you should not. So don't own install it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the end. Thank you. Questions. What, what do you say if you move the if you decrease decrease the refresh rate down to eight uh, eight milliseconds? Yeah. It will make it impossible. Because uh, there was an experiment done by them, and according to their charts. So experimentally, they this one couldn't. Somewhere like right? this is eight or something, yeah. Okay, basically, you can't either add or drain enough charge in that amount of time. Yeah, a okay. given current RAM speed. Yep. Okay, so you cannot hammer it enough times. You cannot speed. hammer it enough times because by the time you're almost there, it gets refreshed. So, does it mean that your charge will leak given sufficient number of hammering? Yes. Okay. That's exactly what this graph uh, shows. Oh, okay. Because okay, okay. the longer you wait, the more hammers you have, and the more hammers you have, the higher the right. the errors. I see. I see. That's okay. what this graph is showing. Okay. Yeah. But is it a stochastic process, or is it like a gradual build up of charge? Oh, you mean how it actually holds a charge? No, no. I mean, when when you do this hammering, right? Uh -huh. The error is it a sto stochastic thing? Like you need to do it a lot of times because you have some probability of you know, finally yeah. flipping it, or you yeah. have like a gradual build up of charge. So I like, you believe know, if you do it enough times, then it gets over a threshold. And I believe the answer is the first one for this, where it's a random thing. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's literally happening. Oh, yeah, it's literally happening. Oh. First time. I see. Uh, quantum tunneling. So quantum tunneling. Oh, quantum tunneling. Yeah. Okay, so you can stop. Electrons. <laughs> Electrons going through things that they are not supposed to pass through. Okay, and, and you the idea that if you smash yourself against the wall enough times, you will get to the other. <laughs> oh! Now assume you're an electron and the right. wall is yeah. the transistor. Okay, okay. Uh, so you need you need the quantity. Yes. Okay. And all the power, but because we don't control the power, the only right. thing we can do is hit more times. Right. So this is not a probabilistic thing. It is probabilistic it's, because it's quantum oh, tunneling is probabilistic. Okay, uh, okay. Because yeah. the more number of times you do it, this so it, it is a probabilistic chance that it will actually go through so the number of times you do it. But if it's probabilistic then it doesn't guarantee it, right? It could it be it could it be it's not a guarantee. In MS no. you can just boom and yes, it will be yes, yes, right? yes, yes, yes. But I think this is this these numbers are over a large number of experiments. Too. Yeah. Right. So it's this good is the number of chips based on the experiments. Yes. yes. Okay. So some ninety five percent uh, Confidence rate. success rate they yeah. have right. these charts. Also don't forget that uh, bit slip and memory randomly yeah. all the time anyway. Cosmic right. rays. Yeah, so they have a big line. Yeah. Okay. Exactly.
but you can't induce them, which is the, the difference. The and is that it's well, just uncontrolled. Yeah. Right. And in this one, it's the weak bits are repeatable. So if you discover a weak bit, there's a very high chance that you can flip that same bit again. That indicates probably a process level mm -hmm. thing where, because of the process, certain bits are much more like likely to flip. Right? Yeah. Probably uh, slightly closer, maybe it's like some mistake, or it could be anything. One nanometer yeah. or one picometer closer to the next transistor or whatever. Yep. Uh, or just you know uneven doping. Yeah, uneven doping. Yeah. Right. So if I if I download a program and I yeah. run it on my laptop a lot of times, yeah. will it spoil my RAM? It could wear down your right. RAM. I think RAM has a wear limit. I'm not sure, but let's put it this way. The thing uh, is, your RAM is going to get refreshed anyway. Right, so... Uh, okay, let's put it this way, right? Uh, you see that machine in front of you. Uh -huh. It's bloody ancient, the RAM's still working. <laughs> it's been through a lot. Okay, so the yeah. lifespan of RAM is so long that you generally don't need to worry about it. Okay. Right, okay. If anything, it's going to be either the controller on the memory or the traces that will die, and this does not affect that in any way. Mm. If you have old machines still running DDR3, I recommend using them because that's a. Okay. You, if you run the Google test, you could find uh, you machines. Can you hear it running? Does it have that high pitch, you know, like that noise that it you can only barely hear? Like, I don't think so. No. <laughs> no, but you, you know, the, the, the sound like that you hear, right? Yeah, like, 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 goes over your car, it's very high. Or like a bit but in this case, you'll be able to the interference. But I don't think RAM makes any sound. That's what I'm asking. So, yeah. so from RAM you found the I don't think so. You'll get lots of yeah. PMI from your address lines though. You can pick that up and you can do something fun with it. If you want to do an art project. But it's yeah. going to be <laughs> hard to... to, to, to it, it's they're really close by. Yeah, and, and it's binary. So flaw and it's unpatched. So that's yes. the end of it. Yeah. We'll throw away all your machines. <laughs> throw away everything, start over. Yeah. You know what we need to do? We need to go back to having like 180 nanometer process. <laughs> like, hey man, Never I, I have an awesome laptop that has 512 megs of RAM. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, you can. So there was a JavaScript uh, thingy recently where... Uh, yeah, yes, you can. Uh, uh, I so believe yeah, they use e, uh, ECC grade RAM, yeah. Yeah. but still, you can. So the fun thing is, someone was trying to see if they could get QMU to stop passing the CL flush instruction through. The uh -huh. conclusion is, yes, you can stop QMU from sending the CL flush instruction through, but it doesn't help because everyone runs QMU with KVM. Oh. Mm -hmm. And because what KVM does is it goes, yo, CPU, you're going to take care of this with me, right? <laughs> At which point you're down to patching the, uh, the processor. So the only thing you can do is like hope to high heavens that Intel releases a microcode update to disable CL flush, which they'll never do. So, is the CL flush used a lot? No. Okay. Like kind of. A I mean, it's an explicit patch line flush. I can imagine remote well, performance yeah. things where it might be useful, but in the grand scheme of things, you can live without it. Sounds like a dangerous instruction. Oh, okay. It's only x86, x right? Like so. N64. Oh, oh, right. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, the, the Android one, uh, basically that paper explains how this entire thing can work in ARM oh, yeah. because ARM doesn't have yeah. a CL flash. Mm -hmm. So, so in ARM, what you do is what Chinmay said earlier. Oh, oh, what? Oh. Uh, Using on ARM, what you do is what Chinmay said earlier, which is where you map and unmap things yeah. repeatedly to cause a flush. Oh, oh. damn. Well, actually, you spoiled it. Otherwise, I would have said you should do that paper for next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So if you map enough things, you will just flush the cache, right? Because, yeah. Ah. That makes sense. Cool. Do you want to do your finishing yes. stuff? Thank you. Well, the finishing thing I kind of started already. So. Uh